Uh, we have Sister Parks in here, Brother George, Pastor Campbell, Brother Roger, and Tara. So it's, uh, it's good to see you all. And then we'll have some more people joining us on Facebook as we go live. And I'm going to monitor that uh, in a different on a different screen so that I can see the see the comments a little better. Uh, there we go. Hold on one second. Especially when I'm teaching, it's it's a little harder to see the comments. And the thing is, I want I'm going to be asking some questions tonight uh, that I will want some input. Uh, so uh, just just uh, overcome your shyness or whatever. Uh, we're going to uh, this is going to be a little more interactive than we have in the past. Uh, so I want you all to uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, I want you to uh, comment in the chat if you can. Those of you who are joining us on Facebook, um, we look forward to hearing from all of you. Uh, we want uh, this to be an interactive lesson. Uh, we're going, uh, I'll, I'll share what we're going to be talking about in just a minute. Um, and uh, I did want to tell you that tomorrow night we are having our Celebrating Good News. And uh, our special guest is uh, Jerry Demings, the mayor of Orange County. Uh, we're very uh, happy about that. Very excited to hear from him. Uh, he's gonna share a little bit about his faith journey um, and his history in public service. So uh, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be a fun conversation. I think you'll all like it and, uh, and he will, It'll help him get a little bit familiar with, with our church. Um, also, I would invite you, since it looks like I'm the only one who's turned their camera on, I would invite any of you to turn your camera on uh, so that I can uh, see your lovely faces. Uh, you will not be on Facebook unless you talk. So uh, it would just be for me so that I can look at people while I'm talking. Um, because <laughs> typically we have one or two that do it and nobody has done it tonight yet. So uh, just, uh, just going to get started here in a moment. Um, don't forget Sunday morning, 9 and 11. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Uh, hey, Brother Roger. Good to see you. I'm going to say a quick prayer before we get started. Father, we thank you tonight, God, for... Uh, keeping us. God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together, uh, no matter what the uh, vehicle is for interaction and community. God, you're in the midst of it, and we are making this connection, Lord, as our Southside Church family. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us tonight, bless the word, help us to glean something, help us to learn something from it, God, that would change us to be better uh, equipped, Lord, to shine your light in this community. Lord, for people to see the joy in our lives, for people to see uh, us walking towards you, Jesus, and, and help us, Lord, to influence others. Lord, we bless you tonight. We bless those who have needs, those who would like to be here, uh, those who are struggling tonight, God. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, give them a special touch, that you would help us, Lord, to be aware of the needs around us, God, and to be uh, to help, Lord, to share your love, God, and touch each and every one in our congregation tonight. We bless your name. Amen. Thank you all. We have, uh, we've got a few here that have joined us and uh, some more on Facebook. We have, uh, can you all hear me okay? Somebody on Facebook saying they can't hear me. Sometimes that is an individual. If you're on Facebook and you're watching, and you, and if you will, let me know if you can hear me if you're on Facebook. Uh, I'm pretty sure people on Zoom, give me a thumbs up, Roger, if you can hear me. Okay, Roger can hear me, he's on Zoom. Uh, Tara says, I can hear you. Uh, somebody, Jenny's is on Facebook, says volume, please. Uh, and I don't know uh, if maybe there's something wrong with Facebook. Ava and Charlie are on there too. Just let us know if anybody else has trouble hearing me on Facebook, but I'm gonna get started here with a lesson. 
Um, I'm going to be teaching tonight. It's it's a, from a book called Greater Than, uh, and it's the teacher is uh, Francis Chan. Uh, I don't know if if you're familiar with Francis Chan. I've heard him speak several times. Uh, interviewed him a long time ago. Uh, he wrote a book called Crazy Love that kind of put him on the map. He to me is just such a solid voice for the church. Um, he is. Uh, Okay, we got some people that say they can hear me. Thank you. Wow, good, good. You people are awesome. Remember, I'm going to be asking questions, so I want you to uh, put in the chat when I'm going to give you some time to respond uh, when we get to the interactive part. Anyway, Francis Chan wrote a book called Greater Than, and I'm going to go through some of that tonight, and we're going to learn. Uh, we're going to have a you know some discussion, interactive Bible study about it. And so we're going to start in Psalm 33 and 6, if you want to follow along. Uh, if not, uh, I'll read it for you, Psalm, Psalm 33 and 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. We are often told that we're all only cosmic accidents, uh, that uh, we're the result of a big bang that happened 14 billion years ago. Uh, I just even recently heard that uh, from someone else. Anytime somebody talks about billions and billions and billions, uh, that is not the worldview I subs uh, uh, subscribe to. Our culture tells us everything happens as a coincidence and there's no ultimate purpose to life, but God tells us otherwise. Do you ever stop and think about the tr this truth God says he's the creator of everything, literally everything. But do you honestly believe that? Do you believe that God is the creator of everything? Or have you bought into the lies that the culture has fed us? Um, and like I said, it doesn't matter uh, where you are. You can be watching something that you feel like is pretty uh, innocuous, uh, something that's pretty uh, innocent, and they will say this uh, billions and billions of years ago, the Big Bang, when they talk about the Big Bang and stuff, uh, that's not the account that we have in the scriptures. I saw a documentary years ago, uh, basically an atheist and a Christian professor who kind of went back and forth. Um, they were friends, but they sparred, uh, they sparred a lot about their their beliefs. And they just went back and forth and they interviewed other atheists. And, uh, and finally, they just drilled this one atheist who was an evolutionist. And they kept saying to that evolutionist, um, you know, what do you believe happened in the very beginning? And he said, well, I believe, you know, a little creature crawled out of mud that became, started becoming, you know, the first step towards human. What happened to mud to create life. How, how did mud all of a sudden, life is a very intricate thing. How did you go from absolutely nothing to life? And so they kept drilling him. They kept drilling this atheist. He's a famous atheist. I, I'm pretty sure it was Richard Dawkins. Uh, and that's not the family feud guy. <laughs> but Richard Dawkins, who had written several atheist books, and they finally drilled him and he said, well, you know, some people believe that alien life form uh, planted seeds on the earth. Well, the first question is where did alien life form come from, right? I mean, where did, where did life come out of nothing? It came from a creator as we know. Uh, but then the second thought I had when I heard that is how much faith how much faith does it take to believe in aliens over the word of God? Like uh, there are people who are saying, well, you can't trust the word of God. How can you trust the idea of aliens over the word of God? It, it just doesn't make any sense. And so to me, when you get off the track of the word and the biblical account of the word, then you're susceptible to anything. The Bible says, believe a lie and be damned. And uh, so we have to watch this. We have to watch things that kind of creep into our mindset. In Isaiah 40 and 26, lift up 
your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. And this goes beyond every understanding that we could possibly ever have uh, that, that God is so infinite that he can count the stars in, in space. Uh, we, we can't count them. We can't even count them, much less name them, much less know where they are, much less keep track of them. We know that God is infinitely bigger than every piece of understanding that we could ever have. Um, do you ever, and if anyone wants to answer this, you can chat, you can unmute yourself. Do you ever marvel at God's creation? Does any, anyone who's listening Anybody who's watching, do you ever sit and marvel at the creation of God? Yes. And, and, and tell me a time that you did, Roger. Where was the last place that you just looked and said, I can't believe that God created this? I, I look at some of the, just the sunsets in Florida, sometimes the clouds, just the, the nature itself. Yeah, I mean, you go into nature, and it's like, how in the world can so much beauty be in this world? It's it's all over the world, though. It's not just here. It's amazing right. you can see the sun from this end and see it from thousands of miles away the same day. You know, it's just like, it's amazing. The beautiful ocean, the sunsets and sunrises. There is no way that this an explosion could have caused this beauty. There's just no way. Right. I, I've never, I'll never believe that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we, as as many of you know, uh, and I and I don't want to be. Alicia Kaylee also said she does. She sits and marvels at the creation of God. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to rub it in anybody's nose that we we're on vacation last week. But uh, we were on vacation and we saw some incredible sights. And there was one time when I was looking at it, and I was thinking. God is so creative. God is amazing that he creates all this out of nothing. And he just, the, the, the skies are his master, master stroke and he just builds things. Um, it's just amazing to think about. You know, when we're in, uh, one thing about Tennessee that we have is mountains. People in Florida don't have mountains, uh, but I've heard uh, somebody said, uh, Tennessee has the mountains, Florida has the sky, has clouds, and it's it's beautiful down here. I've I've never seen the sunset, the the clouds formation, the colors. Sometimes you go outside and it looks like, uh, it looks like something on television or something. I mean, it is a it, it's like it's painted in the sky, and sometimes the the, the colors are so unusual for what you think a sky would be. Uh, it's they're like, they like glow or they're neon or they're purple or something like that. And it's just amazingly beautiful. And we know that God is the author of that. God is the one and, and he wants us to marvel at it more. How in the world do we live in such a beautiful thing and in, in, in such a beautiful place in Florida or Tennessee, or wherever you live, and not take stock of it, you know. Um, I, I'm reminded of the movie, uh, The Color Purple. The whole idea of The Color Purple is, uh, is through a conversation two of the main characters has and says that we walk by The Color Purple sometimes and you don't just marvel at it, you, don't, you know, that it would make God upset the fact that we take it for granted. And I think so many times we do that because uh, we just see it, you know? Uh, I, we make a joke about uh, your first day in a hotel. I've heard Jim Gaffigan talk about this. Your first day in your hotel, uh, you're like, ooh, everything's fancy, everything's nice. Ooh, we got little mints on the pillows, all this stuff. Like your third day in a hotel, you're like, ah, you know, this ain't so nice, you know? It's because you start getting used to it and accustomed to it. and you don't appreciate what you saw the first time you saw it. So sometimes we have to stop 
and look out the window. We have to look up at the sky. We have to look at the beautiful colors. We have to look at the flowers and say, thank you, God. You are so marvelous and you're so above anything we could ever do. Everything we do pales in comparison to what you could do. And God is amazing. It's just amazing. Um, I want all of you to think about this. Now, we're not going to write it down, but I want you to all think. Just take a moment and think, what is the last thing that you marveled at? What's the last thing you looked at and thought, oh, this is beautiful. Thank you, God. Who, who's been to the Grand Canyon? Uh, the Grand Canyon is amazing. Um, I, you know, it, television doesn't do it justice. Videos don't do it justice. You get there and it's just, it's just like it hits you right in the face. And there's a scripture there. The heavens declare the glory of God. You know, it, it, it's his handiwork. And uh, that was one time that I marveled. That's not the last time I marveled, but that's an example of sometimes when you look, I was on uh, a, a ferry boat from Washington, outside of Washington state, uh, going to an island called Orcas Island. It's named after the killer whales. The sun was going down. Hardly anybody was on the ferry boat. I stood on the back, just saw the trail of water from where the boat just came. I saw the sun going down and I just remember worshiping on the back of that ferry boat by myself, singing to God, because it was just so marvelous. It was amazing. And sometimes, sometimes when you marvel, it creates an atmosphere of worship in your heart. Why Do you believe it, that it's important to lift up your eyes and spend time on God's glory in his creation? I think we would all say we do. And thank you, uh, Ava and Patsy, those of you, who, and Claudette, those of you who are commenting on Facebook. This verse that I read, Isaiah, also tells us that God knows billions of stars by name and not one of them is missing. What does this mean for us when we start to get worried about whether God is big enough for our problems? If God is aware of us, uh, I, I may have shared this with you. This is a frequent thing that I, I talk about. Uh, my struggle is hardly ever is God big enough. My struggle in the past sometimes has been, is God small enough? I know he's big enough. I know he can create everything. Is he small enough to see me uh, out of everything else? You know, whatever problems I'm having, is he small enough to see me? Well, somehow he is. It goes beyond our understanding. We have, uh, we, especially when we have hard uh, hard times and we have a lot of people to keep up with in our own human understanding, it's hard to keep up with everybody. Even through this pandemic, it's hard to keep up with everybody. It's hard to touch base with people, especially people who don't reach back out. Uh, but God's not deterred by any of that. God is big enough for everything. Uh, and he is, he ha he knows every one of us by name, Hold on one second. I'm sorry. Uh, my dog opened our bed bedroom door and it's loud in there. So I need somebody to come close it. <laughs> I'm going to read uh, read this and I may have written it, read, read it before, but if I have, uh, you know, you, you may enjoy to read it again, uh, hear it again. Is a big blue whale the biggest thing there is. Hold on one second, I'm gonna close it myself. Okay, sorry about that. Is a big, a blue whale, this is from a children's book, the biggest thing there is. Robert Wells takes uh, the largest um, animal on earth is the blue whale. Just the flippers on the tail is bigger than most animals on earth. But a blue whale isn't anywhere near as big as a mountain. If you put 100 blue whales in a huge jar, you could put millions of whale jars inside of a hollowed out Mount Everest. 
millions of blue whale. Uh, how many we say? Put 100 blue whales in a huge jar. You could put millions of those jars in a hollowed out Mount Everest. But Mount Everest is it anywhere near as big as the Earth? If you stacked 100 Mount Everest on top of each other, it would just be a whisker on the face of the Earth. And the Earth is ne is nowhere near as big as the Sun. You could fit one million Earths inside of the Sun. But the Earth, but the Sun, which is a medium-sized star, isn't anywhere near as big as a red supergiant star called Antares. Fifty million of our suns could fit inside of Antares. Fifty million of our suns, and and. Remember what they just said about how much bigger the sun is than the earth. And then 50 million suns can fit inside Antares. But Antares isn't anywhere near as big as the Milky Way galaxy. Billions of stars, including supergiants like Antares, as well as countless comets and asteroids, make up the Milky Way galaxy that we know. But the Milky Way galaxy any, isn't anywhere near as big as the universe. There are billions, billions of other galaxies in the universe. And yet, filled with billions of galaxies, the universe is almost totally empty. The distances from one galaxy to another are beyond our imagination. We can't even, we can't even compute how long it would take to get from one galaxy to another and there are billions of galaxies. The creator of this universe is God who spoke it into existence with a word. He was present everywhere in this universe and beyond and upholds it all with his mighty power. Great is our God and greatly to be praised. Isn't it amazing sometimes when you think about just how big God is? He is beyond our comprehension. We can't scratch the surface of God. And one of the things I've noticed with atheists or people who don't believe in God, it's not that they don't believe in God, it's that they can't understand him. They don't understand his ways. The Bible says we, that's not on us to do. We, it's not our responsibility to understand his ways. It, we just have to trust him. But I saw that a debate in that same event where I told you about the atheist, the, the, uh, the movie that I saw, the debate, one of the, uh, one of the atheists, basically his thing was, if God, if there really was a God, then how could this happen? He didn't have any concrete physical evidence to disprove God. It was because God did not fit into his brain. So imagine me on a boat out in the ocean, and I encounter an amazing huge mountain that's just beyond big, or Mount Everest or something, and I look and say, well, I don't understand how that mountain came to be, so I don't believe it. Uh, my, do you know how small our brains are? Our brain is right here, right? We know they're small, and we only used a portion of the brain that we have. Everyone knows that. We only use a portion, a small portion of it. Who are we to look at God and say, because I don't understand you, you don't exist? We can't do that. You can't, you can't dismiss God because he goes beyond our comprehension. Uh, there's a lot of things that go beyond your comprehension. Uh, you, it, just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, Anyway, that's a, that's a little aside sermon. Uh, in Romans 1 and 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without an excuse. We're told in this verse that God's qualities have been clearly seen be before the beginning of the world. We have no excuse to ignore God or say we can't see him. God is behind it all. We see his footprints everywhere. We see his fingerprints everywhere. So if we have no excuse, why do you believe we make excuses? 
have you ever this this is something you can silently think about you could put it in the chat you can unmute if you want but you may not have you ever gone through a period where you question the existence of god i think it's human Every, you know everyone all all has doubts from time to time and i think they're all tied to our understanding we don't understand him so maybe he's not there we don't hear him maybe he's not there and the word says that we don't we don't always hear him we don't always understand him that doesn't change the fact that he's there so i think we've all probably had those moments where we have questioned uh, is this really real? What I believe, what I've put my whole life on, is this really real? What What made you think that God wasn't there or he didn't care? Again, for me, it's time when he, he defies my logic. He defies my understanding. And right now we live in a culture where understanding is everything. We have to know why. Uh, there's, no, there's, there's less and less mystery to the world. Uh, when you want to know how something works, you get on the internet and you find out there's no going to the library or there's no just like, well, I never knew that's what we have information overload. Now, you want to know how something works in five minutes, you can find out there's no wondering. And because of that, our brains are wiring more and more to have to have things explained and understood. But this cannot translate into how we feel about God because God is a mystery. God is, he, he allows himself to be known through his word, but we're not going to capture him with our little brains. We're not going to understand everything he is with our little brains. And we have to, we have to know that. We have to trust that unknown, that great unknown. We have to trust the creator of the universe is there and he cares about us. When we begin to neglect our relationship with God or question his existence and creation, sometimes we're saying that we're the center. It's all about us. We're the creators and directors of our own lives. We think about ourselves more than we think about God. How has this worked out for you? When you start focusing on yourself, how does that work out? Typically for me, it doesn't end very well. Have you ever tried to follow your own path and push God to the side? Does anyone want to share about that? A time when you basically, you know, the, the song, Jesus take the wheel. Some, if anybody wants to share a time when you said, okay, God, I'm taking the steering wheel back and I'm going to drive for a little bit. And then you, and then you run off course. Teresa says situations where the only thing that makes sense is only God no other explanation. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you for that comment. Has anyone, uh, anyone comfortable or want to share a time when you feel like that you were serving God, but you just took it, took the controls of your life back for a little while and you made a mess of it? Well, you're free to keep, uh, I'm going to go on. Uh, if you have that in the future, uh, especially if you're following on Facebook, you feel free to put it in the chat and we'll read it. Uh, we're not going to embarrass anybody by any means, but I think we all have times when we have thought we knew better than God. Uh, maybe it was because God told us not to do something. Maybe he told us not to associate with somebody or to was trying to protect us from something. And we said, no, I got it. I'm going to do it anyway. And then you just made a mess out of it. And the good thing, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, that he doesn't just look at us and say, uh, you messed it up, you clean it up. Now, that's what I say. <laughs> that's what I say to my kids a lot. You mess it up, you clean it up. If you would have done what I told you to, you wouldn't have this problem. God's not like that. God will still rescue us. Even when we take control of our lives away from him, all we have to do is call on him and answer. Call on him and he will answer. He will come and take the broken pieces of your life, of my life, anytime that we've denied him, 
anytime we've wandered off, we just have to call him. The Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It doesn't say draw near to God if it's the first time. This is your first chance. It's a freebie. And after that, you're going to have to pay. No, God will rescue you. And maybe somebody needs to hear that tonight. We have uh, about 19 people watching live. We'll have more. Uh, but here, here's the thing. If you have made a mess out of your life, God wants to pick up the pieces. God wants to help you. God wants to put it back together again. And he wants to make it beautiful. He wants to redeem your story. So uh, Jenny said, every day when we make plans before praying for direction, and that's good. There's so many times, that's a really good point, because there's so many times when we, uh, we will decide what to do, and then we'll pray for God's blessing on what we have decided to do. God, I'm taking the reins, but God, will you bless it? Uh, I think, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but young people do this when they find somebody to marry. A lot of people will. They'll look and say, they'll have these little things and they'll say, well, you know, I don't know, this is not a good situation, whatever. And you just, I'm going to do it anyway. God, please bless it. That's what a wedding is, right? A wedding is God bless us. Uh, but bless what I've chosen. And I, I, I've ignored you the whole way, but I, bless what I've chosen. Again, thank you, God, for not letting us die on our own and live with the consequences, but thank you for rescuing us out of so many decisions that we make where we ignore you. Psalm 19 and 1, the heavens, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And as I told you, there that I hope it's still there is a sign at the Grand Canyon that says that. And it is beautiful. It's beautiful that in this majestic scenery that we are we are reminded with a little piece of wood that who is the creator of that? It's almost like a little plaque that says, hey, by the way, God did this. God is in charge of it all, and he designed and made everything. There's no excuse to say there is no God. I'm glad all of this randomly happened. Now we look up and we can't help but say the heavens truly do declare the glory of God. In 1 Timothy 6, 16, he alone is immortal and dwells in unapproachable light. No one has ever seen him, nor can anyone see him. To him be honor and eternal dominion. When we think about God, we often place our human limitation and ideas on him. And God does have human attributes. Uh, we think of his love as a fatherly love. And I shared at my dad's memorial last week about uh, an attribute of my earthly father that reminds me of my heavenly father, uh, the love he has and, and, and the care that he has. Some of you have heard me say that my, my dad gave me a signed checkbook and basically said, don't go without, don't be embarrassed, don't go hungry. Uh, he trusted me enough to do that and I tried not to abuse it, uh, but I would make a mess out of my finances. I would spend too much money on something and I would have to write that check and and dad was okay with it and uh, there were other times when I would mess things up and I would try to figure it out on my own um, but but my dad didn't want me to do that he he had that's why he gave me the signed checkbook and I think for us with God a lot of us walk around with a signed checkbook in our pocket and we're afraid to pull it out we're afraid to approach God and say, please fix this for me. I have made a mess of it. So that's an attribute. That's a human attribute that I have uh, from my earthly father that reminded me of my heavenly father. Maybe, but, but some of our limitations, some of our uh, examples as it pertains to God uh, are, are limitations that we, we don't want to put on him. Like if you have a strained relationship with your father, or with your mother, and they, they treat you like you're never good enough for love and affection, then we place the emotions of our earthly father onto our heavenly father. And suddenly we believe we can never be good enough for God's love. 
Have you ever done this? Have you ever thought that I'm not good enough for the love of God? What earthly limitations and emotions have you placed on God? I'll, I'll say one of mine. And if anybody else has one, you're welcome to unmute or chat. Uh, how many of us think that God has a limited amount of blessings? <laughs> I've shared about this before too. Uh, when we have a prayer request and maybe our car won't start or something, and you're about to, you know, you're in a group of people and you're about to say, uh, you know, I need prayer for my car. I need to find a place to, you know, to live or something. And then right before you do that, somebody says, well, so-and-so is dying of cancer. And you almost don't even want to mention your request because in the grand scheme of things, in our human understanding, theirs is important and ours is not because maybe God has a limited amount of blessings and, and we just need to let the priority go to those. But God is big enough for all of them. That's a human limitation that we put on God that because we, if we were in that situation, we can only do so much that we think maybe God could only do that much. But that's not true. God has a limitless supply. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. Uh, so there's no reason for us to put our limitation on his, uh, on understanding him. God is holy, immortal, and beyond everything that we could ever comprehend. Again, the title of this book is Greater Than, and that's the truth. Greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. In Acts 17, 24, and 25, the God who made the world and everything in it and the Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples built by human hand, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. This is the God we serve. He is a God beyond our comprehension, and he alone is the one who gives us life and breath and everything we see. How does this knowledge change how you see God? Is God approachable to mortals like us? Why or why not? Do you think God is approachable? Everyone think God is approachable? Raise your hand. That's a joke because I can only see Roger. <laughs> but raise your hand if you think that we can approach God. After everything we've just said, after all how big he is, uh, he's bigger than all the galaxies put together, yet we can still approach him. Isaiah 40, 28. Do you not know, have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired and weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. But then in Jeremiah 1 and 5, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Isn't that powerful? That just... I feel the Lord. I feel the Lord even thinking about that. Before I formed you in the womb, I set you apart. I chose you. His fingerprint was on us before we were born, before we ever knew, before we ever knew us, he knew us. Before we were ever aware of our own selves, God was aware of us. The creator of the universe, everything we've ever seen, and everything we could never see knew us from the very beginning. If God has determined where and when we would be born, then there's a very specific reason that you're alive today. There is a specific reason you're born to be alive in 2020. You ever thought about that? Why am I alive now? Why wasn't I born in the old west? Why wasn't I born back in Bible times? There is a specific purpose for you being here right now. God ordained it. And we have to trust that, that God is going to reveal that purpose. It could be that you're influencing your family. It could be that you're influencing your neighbors or that you're, uh, you're being a light to people who need to, to, for you to be a light to them. There is a purpose. It's not random. As we said in the beginning, if we reject the whole idea of a random creation for the world, then let's reject the idea of a random 
birth for us. It was not random. It is planned. God planned for us to be here right now. And if he did not, I always, I love this. Somebody said, if he did not have a purpose for me being here right now, I would be in heaven with him right now. Why else would we be here? He would want us to be with, with him. We are fulfilling our purposes here until we draw our last, last breath. Please close that door. So heaven and earth, why are you here? Are you living as if your purpose is to make yourself known? Are you living to make God known? Think about that. Are you living to make yourself known? Are you living to put your name in history books? Are you here to lift up God who is above the history books? Who's the whole reason we exist? We're here to make him known. If you forget about me, um, you're, you're not going to lose anything. But if you forget about God, then you've lost everything. God, Jesus, in my life is the only thing worth a hoot. <laughs> Does anybody feel that way? The only good thing, there's a, there was a song years ago, if, if there's anything good in me, it's Jesus. Uh, so without Jesus, we're not worth knowing. It's Jesus who brings us to life and gives us life abundantly. Heaven and earth, you know the scripture, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will remain. Heaven and earth, that means everything on heaven and earth, everything. And in a hundred years, none of this will be here. None of us who are sitting here listening None of us will be here in a hundred years. Uh, and it's and right now, especially in 2020, we've had such a, a year of loss and a, a turnover. Um, and I, I, have a, I have a word on my heart about that that I wanna share with the church sometime. Um, but we've had such a year of loss, uh, but what that means is uh, none of us are gonna be here forever. Uh, nothing is going to last forever, but the word will remain. The word has been going. It has shaped civilizations. The person who preached Jesus 2,000 years ago is not with us today, and yet Jesus is still here. His word is still here, so it doesn't depend on us. God uses us, but after we're long gone and before we got here, Jesus was. Jesus will continue. Are you actively feeling your way toward God by pursuing a relationship with him? How are you pursuing this relationship with him? Do you spend time in his word? Do you pray? Do you worship him? Do you spend time in awe of his creation and his wonder? I'm going to stop for just a second and read a few comments that we've had coming in. I thank you so much for your comments, uh, Patsy and Jeannie's and uh, Ava. Rufus says, God is anywhere, anywhere he's always approachable. And amen to that. Teresa says, I felt many times God always has a way to remind me that he can and will handle it all. Nothing too big, nothing too small, and nothing is insignificant. Amen. Claudette says, yes, we can. God invites us to come to him. He gave us access to the throne of grace. He said, call unto me and I will answer you. Do we, do we really think about that? Why do we try to handle things on our own so much when God just wants us to access him, just contact him? He is waiting. He's waiting to help us with our problems. He's waiting to help us fix our lives. He's waiting. There's so many things in my life where I've sat, I, I've been, <laughs> I've lost sleep. I've lost sleep trying to think of a way to figure out my way out of a problem and I'm not praying about it. Why don't I pray? Why isn't pray, prayer our first reflex? Why don't we approach God? He wants us to. And if you don't hear anything else tonight, touch, approach God. God is approachable. He's all powerful. He's holy. 
He's omnipotent, but he is approachable. Our culture in 1 Peter 2 and 9, you are chosen, you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may, may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Our culture tells us there's no rhyme or reason to life other than to have fun, get ahead, but we know we're here for so much more. We've been called out of darkness into his light, into his light, but are you still living in darkness? Uh, what are some areas of darkness that you may still be living in? Uh, and the, uh, darkness could include a secret sin, but it also could be uh, the way that our outlook or the way we treat others, the, the way you treat her yourself, or sometimes your reluctance to approach God. Let's let God illuminate every part of our lives. God, please just shine your light on my life. Uh, search me and know me and see if there's any wicked way in me. How do I treat others? When I go out to a restaurant, when I go to the grocery store, do I have, do I show the joy of the Lord? Do I walk with an awareness of who you are? And, and do I, uh, am I intentional about rescuing other people from the fires of hell? Are we intentional about that? Do we really believe that people need to hear the good news? If so, we need to be doing it. I heard this last week. Uh, if, you, if you pray for rain, you better carry an umbrella. So basically what that means, if you're, if you're praying one way, then you need to put some action to it. And so I would encourage all of us for this, uh, just to be intentional. Show the joy of the Lord, show the light. Uh, to the, everyone who comes around, everyone you encounter. I think we're about out of time. I'm going to cut it short here. It's 7.53. If anyone has anything they want to add to this, uh, uh, you can unmute yourself. We appreciate all the interaction. Thank you all for, uh, for chatting on Facebook and, and giving your uh, uh, given input. But if anybody on Zoom wants to uh, wants to say anything, I'm going to give you a moment. Uh, you can unmute yourself. And my old pastor would say, "If if all minds are clear, all right." I'm just going to say a prayer, uh, and. Uh, Again, I appreciate all of you joining tonight. I want us, I want to be more like the Lord. I want to be more like Jesus. And I want, uh, I want other people to join us. Uh, heaven is not exclusive and our church is not an exclusive club. Uh, we want, it's the more the merrier. And God wants us to, sh to share the good news. Somebody shared it with us. Somebody showed the joy of the Lord to us. And we saw the joy in them and we said, that's what I want. And that's how we should live for other people. Let's, uh, I'm just gonna say a quick prayer and, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you, God, for this night. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who's joined us tonight. I pray that uh, people are blessed. Thank you, God, for being so uh, beyond our understanding. Thank you, God, for being so grand and yet you invite us to approach you. You invite us to have a relationship with you and you give us access, Lord, to your promises. Thank you, God. We give you praise, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for knowing us when we were in our mother's womb, for calling us, for choosing us, God, before anyone, before the world put any type of value on us, you put value on us. Oh, thank you, God. We bless your name tonight, God. You're good, Lord. You're great and greatly to be praised. We lift you up. God, we, we love you, Jesus. We pray, Lord, that we walk this week, walk during this week worthy of your choosing, worthy of, of who you called us to be. Lord, open our uh, ears for opportunities. 
help our help the spirit lord to give us unction to touch someone where they when they need to hear from you when they need a touch from you god we pray lord tonight help us to be the light in your name we pray god we love you jesus we adore you amen amen Please remember that uh, tonight, um, uh, tomorrow night, we'll have Mayor Demings on our Celebrating Good News program. Thank you all so much. Uh, Sunday morning, again, we'll have nine and 11 service. Thank you all for joining uh, us on uh, Facebook and on Zoom. We love and appreciate you. Uh, we were gone. Uh, we were gone Sunday before last for my dad's funeral. We were gone this past Sunday on a planned uh, vacation that had been in the works for a while. And we missed, we missed you all. We missed Southside. Uh, and so we love you very much. Uh, you're a precious group of people. And I believe God has planted us in this community, in Winter Garden, to make a difference for this area. This area needs it. Right now, everybody needs it, right? But this area, we have been hit hard. You'll you'll hear on our uh, on our uh, conversation with the mayor tomorrow. This touristy area has been hit hard with a shutdown, and there is a lot of opportunity for us to be a light to others and to show the life of love of Christ when people are hurting. So we love you, uh, and we will see you tomorrow night and Sunday morning. God bless you.